this tape. It's called Make It Plain, and it was a tape that was on Channel 13 about two weeks ago. Make, make It Plain, and it's the newest documentary on the life of Malcolm X. And I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Bill Foster, and I'm in the Department of Special Programs, and I'd just like to thank you all for coming out to help us celebrate Black History Month, particularly celebrating the life of Malcolm X. Yesterday, as you know, was the Memorial Day of his assassination, and there were a lot of activities going on all around the college, and all around the, all around the city. <coughs> Today is our special day. Uh, today I would like to introduce to you two guests that we have. We have two professors, brothers, people who have really committed their lives to the study of our people, to the study of what it is that we've done in the past and what we have to do in the future. They're multi-talented men, and that they basically have come to us from Guru College. And I'd like to introduce to you Professor Arthur Lewin and Professor Tony Terry Morris. I'm sorry. I, I don't know how I, how I get these names mixed up. I, I tend to. <laughs> professor Lewin wrote the book, Africa is not a country's continent. And some of you might be familiar with that book. And um, Professor uh, Morris is an attorney at law. And he also wrote the book, No Justice, No, no Peace, from Emmett Till to Rodney King. And so without further ado, I'm not here to talk, but we have two guest speakers to talk to today. Professor Morris and is not a country, it's a continent, and our story, the history of African America from 1950 to the year 2000. I'm going to be brief. Basically, life is a process of transformation. Everything has a season, a small storm eventually becomes a hurricane. A caterpillar eventually becomes a butterfly. So in the process of transformation, we had a man who moved from a dope pusher to eventually a universal leader who moved from stealing and robbing in the streets of Harlem to educating people in the Congress in Ivy League schools. He shaped and he motivated Brother Malcolm X. Today you will meet Malcolm X in person. Some of you probably will wonder what would I have asked Brother Malcolm were he alive today? How would he deal with some of the problems affecting our communities today? What does he think about the movie that Spike Lee made? What about the problems currently within the nation of Islam? What about the problems with the Jewish community? Dr. Lewin today will be in the form of Malcolm X when you meet him. And I want to urge audience participation. I want you to grill Malcolm, to find out what exactly Malcolm is about. Today, in 1994, without further ado, Brother Malcolm X.
It's a pleasure to be here in this black institution of higher learning. And I just have one thing to, to say today, ladies and gentlemen. Who taught you to hate yourself? Who taught you to hate your hair? Who taught you to hate the way your nose is shaped, the way your lips are shaped? Who taught you that? The white man taught you that. That's who taught you that. Now you have to stop sweet talking the white man. Stop telling him everything is okay because he believes it. You are your own, we are our own worst enemy. We sweet talk the white man. Yes, sir, boss. Yes, sir, boss. Everything's okay, boss. And he believes it. You have to let him know he's got to clean his house up. He's got to get his house in order. And if he doesn't clean his house up, then he doesn't deserve to have a house. You should catch on fire. Burn down. To have once become a criminal, it's not a disgrace. Many of our brothers are in the corner doing the wrong thing. It's not a disgrace. I was once a criminal myself. I was a big criminal. I was one of the biggest ones. To have once become a criminal is not a disgrace. To remain a criminal is a disgrace. Now listen, brothers and sisters, we're not teaching you to love the white man. We're not teaching you to turn your cheek to the brutality of the white man. Not in the South, not in the North, not in Mississippi, not in Bensonhurst. Anytime anybody puts their hand on you, you're within your right to make sure they don't put it on anybody else. I'm here to reveal something to you today. The black man, the black woman, the black child, so many of us, we hate ourselves. We say, that brother has good hair. That sister has, is fair. You see? But if their hair is good, then what is our hair? Bad. So God punish you. God punish me by giving us hair like this. We have bad hair. Look in that Webster's Dictionary to define the hair that this young man has. And what will you see? Nappy, kinky, coarse, nothing positive about it. I'm here to tell you one thing and one thing only. Love yourself. Love ourselves. But why do we hate ourselves? Well, let me tell you something. You know, it's one thing if the teacher's white. If the policeman, the president, the mayor, the governor is white. But when God is white too, <laughs> you're in a world of trouble. If anyone gives you a God and it doesn't look like you, you give them that God back. No people on this earth worships a God that does not look like them, except the American Negro, the Caribbean Negro. We're all God's children, don't get me wrong. We're all God's children. But when the people who produced all the great prophets, all the great civilization, all the science, are going around thinking that God does not look like them, and everybody else has appropriated our prophets, and those are our people, and we're walking around thinking we have bad hair, thinking we're ugly, thinking God doesn't love us, I'm here to tell you that you're wrong. Minority. What are you, a minority? A minority of what? You were not a minority in 1960, and you sure ain't one now. Non-white. How can you be non-white? If white is the absence of color, 
how can you be non-white minority? How is that possible? White is the absence of color. You have something that the white lacks. You're not non-anything, and you're certainly not a majority. Not in the city, not in the hemisphere, and not in God's world, not in this world. Alien? What alien? This is your home. The most important thing that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught me and taught all of us is do for self. Do for self. Yes, the white man is the devil. Yes, he has us in this hell. Yes, he has oppressed us from Africa up until the present. Yes, but who will liberate us? We shall, when we take control of our African mind. In this country, 17% of the African students in college, African, African students in college in America, attend black institutions. And Medgar Evers is one, it's a black institution. Only 17%, but of those who graduate, 38% come from black institutions of higher learning. When I came here today, I could just feel the spirit of Brother Medgar Evers, who took 30 years to finally get justice, right? I could just feel all the positive vibrations, the young people, the older people, the students, all gathered here for one thing, knowledge of self, is written on the pyramid, know thyself. That's the most important lesson for, for us all. And here I see a, a gentleman who I think is a, is a bringer of knowledge. I believe you're affiliated with the bookstore? With the college. He's an official of this great institution, as Bill Forster is and the people we see around here. Finally, I would like to speak to you, the young people, and see what's on your mind, and see what challenges you face. It was one world in 1965 when I left you, and it's another world 30 years later. But I would like to close my formal remarks by saying, you, brothers and sisters, are the people who created civilization. You, brothers and sisters, are the people who developed the idea of God. You, brothers and sisters, are the founders of all the major knowledge on this earth. And when you leave here, remember your great responsibility. Remember your great challenge. Remember, God loves you. God looks like you. You are an African, and you are of the first rank. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Do you have any questions for Brother Malcolm? Don't all go at once. <laughs> the picture that, that that's, you know that picture that's usually in everyone's home of a white Jesus? Do you know who that person is? Oh, thank you, sister. The, I'll tell you what, ha what I notice is this. Many of the pictures look alike, right? Now, up until, up until 500 years after Christ, all pictures of Christ were painted black. All pictures of Christ were painted black until about five, 600 years after Christ lived under earth. Then, most pictures were still painted black, pictures of Christ, until the 15th century when Michelangelo did some artwork in the Vatican and he began to change the images of Christ. Today, the Pope that we have today, when he goes into the chapel and prays every morning, he, played, he prays before a black Christ. And you can see the picture of that in the book, uh, but they never told you in history 
what they never told you in history class by the author's name is Kush, K-U-S-H. Now, who this gentleman is, he, he was probably, they say that the, the contemporary pictures that we see of Christ is of a white Polish man. I don't know where he lived or what time, but they all tend to look alike. But this is just a recent phenomenon in world history. relative of Michelangelo, one of his cousins, I believe. Okay. I would like to know, where did you get your philosophy from? Thank you, young lady. Well, I got my philosophy, my first philosophy that I got, I got from the home. My parents taught me what is right and what is wrong. And my father was a very strong disciplinarian. And he was a follower of a man that you may have heard of called Marcus Garvey. And we, I had uh, seven brothers and sisters, and he ran a tight ship. And he didn't take anything from anybody. He lived, we lived in a town in Michigan. And Michigan had, at the time, the 1930s, had four times as many Klansmen as Mississippi. Uh, you talk about up, down south, and up north. You're up north, you're up south. So what happened was that the Klan did not like my father because he was independent. He wanted to do for self. He spoke out all the time. And one day they burned our house, and one day they killed him. And so I was left, the family was left to drift. My mother did as best she could, and ultimately drove her mentally, gave her problems, and she was institutionalized. That was my first set of teachings. And my second set of teachings came from the street. And I was strong in the street. And I learned, dog eat dog. And I learned to carry a gun and to commit crimes. And I thought I was doing the right thing. But then my third teachings came from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And it reinforced the teachings of Marcus Garvey and the teachings of my father. And that is what I'm sharing with you here today. Thank you. I wanted to know, was you real close to Did you know him? Did I know who? Malcolm X. I am Malcolm X. What, what, Terry? All right, uh, what will happen is uh, Dr. Malcolm X will come out of character afterwards and he'll handle any additional questions you have as Dr. Lewin. But right now, we're dealing with Malcolm X. Okay. I want to know how old were you when you joined the Nation of Islam? When I when I joined the Nation of when I joined the Nation of Islam, I was oh so long ago. I was about twenty four years old. Twenty four years old. I was in prison at the time. I was jailed at the age of twenty, and I was kept in jail for ten. I was sentenced for ten years. I was let out after seven years, and I converted while I was in prison. Yes, ma'am. What could I teach you about black on black crime? Well, you see, well, I would like to tell you something about that, but I haven't been on the scene in 30 years. Tell me, what is different now about the crime of today than before? Tell us. begin by saying that crime is never right. You never, you, you, you should never commit crime. A crime is a crime is a crime and it's wrong. But let me say that when I was around, we had crime, but it was not as serious as it is today. When I was around, you see, crime was not the problem. That was not the problem. The fact that we couldn't vote in many parts of the country was a problem. The fact that we couldn't hold a decent job, that was a problem. The, the, the fact that there were hardly any black policemen in New York or any city, that was the problem. The fact that we had to sit in the back of the bus, that was the problem. And you see, we knew that we had a problem and we mobilized against it. Now we still have a problem today 
the civil rights and getting our fair share. But a much far larger problem is the problem the lady has just mentioned, the sister has just mentioned. It's the problem of violence in the streets. When we were coming up, there were certain cities where you had problems, they had gangs, but you see, if you struck somebody with an aerial or a rock, or even if somebody was cut by a razor, they could come back another day. But what has happened is that the young people today are confusing fiction with fact. When you watch, you know, when in the 60s we had the old westerns, the shoot 'em ups right? And the good guys versus the bad guys, and they would shoot each other up. And you see people dropping like flies, but by the end of the show, only two people have been hurt. You see? But it doesn't work like that. When somebody, when you make a mistake with a gun, you can't come back from that. And what I can see, and what I can tell you, is that we are in a war right now, but we don't know it's we're in a war. We think it's free speech what we see on television. We think it's artistic license to show people killing each other in the very settings in which we live. To show 10-year-olds shooting 12-year-olds, as in many of the movies we see today, right? We think that's okay, we think it's all right. We think it's free speech when young men disrespect the sisters in the music that they make. When they disrespect each other by calling each other names that no white man can call us. We say that's free speech because we're confused. Because we're confused. The Klan never had a, a plan as great as they apparently have right now in which our young men can kill each other. Yes, sir. Let me give you, thank you. Let me give you an example. There was, for example, there was a record, James Brown, I'm Black and I'm Proud, okay? Aretha Franklin, Respect, okay? Curtis Mayfield, What Color Would You Choose? There was a whole, there was, you see, back then we had black music. You see? Motown was popular music, but it was black music. If somebody, if you, pick, if you turn on your radio dial today and you hear somebody singing and they sound black, right? <laughs> you know, what they say, every brother ain't a brother because that's not black music. It's not black until you write it, you are inspired by it, you write it, you produce it, you package it, you sell it, and you make the profit. Anything else that's not totally controlled by us is not of our making. To come back to the, to the feeling, to come back to the feeling of the 60s. You see, Harlem is the capital of black America. Is the capital of our nation in America. You see, Harlem has undergone a transformation. It still is the capital. That's the seat of our power. We have to rescue Harlem. If we don't rescue Harlem, we will continue to be adrift. This is why the Apollo Theater is now under our control. This is why we have radio programs coming out of there in an attempt to recapture the African mind. When I was alive in 125th Street, there were street side speakers. This was democracy in action. Anybody that had something to say could bring their soapbox and speak to the people and interact. When I was alive, we had our problems in Harlem, we had our problems in New York, but you could ride the subway any time of night. And in the 40s, you could spend the night in Central Park without anybody bothering you if it was hot. You'd camp out there. And brothers and sisters, Harlem can be what it was before and we can rise again. But it's up to you. Any other questions? The most important solution that I could offer is to understand that it's good to have a leader. 
It's good to have people that you admire. But you must remember one thing. Once you put all your eggs in one basket, once you put all your eggs in one basket and sit back and think, oh, Mr. Jones will be the leader. Mrs. Smith will be the spokesperson. I don't have to work. They can do it. Once you put all your eggs in one basket, there will be no omelet tonight. In other words, it can easily be broken. Because what we did in the 60s, once they killed the leadership, people were adrift. You have to understand that you all are leaders. That you all are leaders. You have certain ideas you believe in, but you, we all are leaders. I would also like to tell you, that's one thing. Another thing I would like to tell you is that the most important thing you can do is what you are doing right now is to continue your education under the direction of black teachers, black administrators, black parents, African-American community people. No one will teach us our past except us. Another thing that I would say is very important is never, never get lulled into a false sense of security. If you're in school and you're in college and you have a B, very good. Don't think that's OK. Do to the best of your ability. Everyone's not going to get an A, but work to the best of your ability. You see, there's a tradition that they have, at least in the 60s. I don't know if they still have it now. In many of the, many of the white campuses, the, 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 they would join fraternities, swallow goldfish, act foolish, and they would say, oh, these are just young people letting off steam. You see, we don't have time for that. <laughs> we don't have time for that. We don't have time to, to, to read a book on Thursday, watch television on Friday, and shake, shake our you-know-what on the dance floor on Saturday and get drunk and forget who we are. We don't have time for that. Maybe other people have time for that. But each of you, every single one of you, is a warrior and a leader. Life, everyone is a link in the chain of life that extends from now to your very first ancestor. And please, do not be a thief of time. Do not waste the time that God has given us. Any other questions? <coughs> What do you have to say? Okay. According to the movie directed by Spike Lee, the Nation of Islam conspired to have you assassinated. Do you have anything to say about that? Yes. What I would like to say, I'd like to say a few things about that. Let me preface my remarks by saying this. There's one thing I know for sure. And that is that everybody here will die one day. The price for life is death. There's no survivors in life. There's nobody too young to understand that. All right? It's a great interest when a man first dies as to who killed him. And it's a great interest. OK? After a while, you know, it's not that important anymore. Because there's nothing on this earth that happens that doesn't happen by the hand of God. And what I'm trying to tell you is this. The past is the past. Who assassinated me? Why did they do it? You know the answer. You know the answer. All the books are in the library. Read, see, come to the conclusion. But there's no time, there's no place for us to look at the past and become imprisoned by it. There's only time for us to move together into the future. And I want to say something else about, just briefly since you mentioned Spike Lee's movie. A lot of people criticize Spike Lee about that movie. A whole lot of people. But I tell you this, at least he made a movie about me. They never, they never even made the movie the first on me. Okay? Uh, 
At least he tried to enunciate a statement. And I want to say something else. A lot of people walking around today talking about how they were my friends, how they were with me. If, if half of those people were with me, I'd be here in the flesh today. Yes, ma'am. I knew, I knew, let me tell you, let me tell you something. I knew and you know what your future is, right? How many of us here have woken up with a dream and the dream has come true? How many of, right? How many of us get a feeling and the feeling is right, okay? You know the answer to these things. You see, don't let the white man fool you. You have the soul, you have the power, you have the spirit. Listen to it, you will never go wrong. Yes, ma'am. Let me, let me show you. Okay, you see this? You see? That's Dr. King and I were shaking hands right there. You see? Let me tell you something. There's a thing where, there's a thing where, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer your question. There's a thing there when, with, with the police. When the police get you, you know what they do? They play good cop, bad cop. There's one cop that's going to beat you up or throw the book at you, and there's the only one that wants to be your friend. And between the good cop and the bad cop, you're so scared, you think he's helping you, and you commit to things you never even dreamed of. What Dr. King and I were doing, we were playing, in a sense, good cop, bad cop. If they didn't want to deal with Dr. King, then they would have to deal with me. And one day, when, Minister, when uh, Mr. Rockwell and the American Nazi Party threatened Dr. <coughs> King, I said, if he puts his hand on Dr. King, he'll have to deal with me. And we heard no more from Minister Rockwell. Okay? You see, I tell you one thing, in your relationships with the man, with the white man, never let him know all the connections between you. Never let him know who is in charge or who is the this or who is the that. That's between you and your people. You show them whatever front you want to show them. But we were all about one thing and that's the liberation of our people. And years later, my, Dr. King himself was taken from this planet when he began to speak in a very more independent way. But that was his sentiment all along. But the time wasn't right. Who else didn't ask a question? Anyone didn't? Yes, sir. I'll try the best I can, brother. I'll try my best. Thank you for that question. You see, to answer your question, I want to make a parallel to the situation with Brother Khalid Mohammed and uh, Minister Farrakhan and Jesse Jackson and Kwesi and Fume and the whole gang. In that tragic little episode, we could sit down and try to figure out who's to blame. Why did Khalid Muhammad say those things? And why did Minister Farrakhan renounce him? And why did, why did Jesse Jackson get on television and renounce this man without speaking to Farrakhan first? Right? And why did the, the, the head of the Congressional Black Caucus jump up there and be manipulated like a puppet on a string? You see, it's easy for us to sit back and criticize. The failure in that episode, you can't put your finger on who is to blame. It's the fault of the group. It's the fault of the group. When Kwese and Fume runs for Congress, and when Major Owens runs, and the other people run, 
who gives them the money? You see? Who gives them the money? Where did we go wrong? What I'm trying to say is, it's not so much that we went wrong. The only place we went wrong is that we didn't, that we became complacent. We thought the struggle was over. The struggle is never over. Reading the, reading the Bible about Job, look at how God tested Job. Why did he test him like that? Because he loved him. To show his love for him. Why is it that we believe that we, that we deserve the land of milk and honey? Why is it that we believe that we should get to a point where we can kick up our feet in the desk and say, all the struggle is done, now I can reap my benefit? Why do we want heaven on earth? How come we don't understand that life is always a struggle? You were born to struggle. And we were born to use this wonderful mind we have to solve the problems that confront us. And when we solve one problem, another one shall occur. And what is the essential problem? The preservation of the people. Did you ever think about going back into the streets to bring your old friends into the nation of the I did do that when we first came out. We call that fishing expeditions. We would go on fishing expeditions, and we would go and try to speak to people. When I wrote to some of my colleagues from prison, they laughed at me. They said, what are you into, some new hustle or something like that? But when I came out, we went to the different places. We went to the pool halls. We went to the, we went to the, uh, the dance halls, and we began to get people out. And the, and the basis of the Nation of Islam was people who we had rescued. But since, since we, I left the scene, a number of changes took place. Much of that was destroyed, but it's coming back again now. And you know, it's really, it's really amazing when you come down to the temple and you see the young brothers and sisters, fine, strong, young black men. No foul words coming from their mouths. No 40 ounce, a bit old English, they, this is what they're drinking now, sisters. This is, what, this is what they told me. It used to be Thunderbird in my day. But, but now it's something, uh, some other, malt liquor, which we didn't even have back then. But you don't see that. And at first, you'll be shocked. Because how can you see all these strong, young, vital black men, sharp as a tack, dressed, respectful, dressed to kill? Yes, yes, ma'am. There was a man, there was a man called Abraham, and Abraham had two sons. Now, I'm gonna tell you this story, but I'm not gonna stop and tell you as I'm telling you this story. Say this one was black or whatever, because everybody I'm gonna tell you about were African people. These were all black people. Everyone, okay? There was a man called Abraham. He had two sons, right? And his two sons were what? Esau and Jacob, right? And Jacob had two sons, Ishmael and Israel. I, it's been a long time, if I get my chronology a little bit off. But it was two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac was the father of the Jews. Ishmael was the father of the, of the, of the Arabs, okay? Now this man, Abraham was a great man. And these, Two nations sprang from him. And Moses came up on the side of the Jews many centuries later. And Moses was a prophet, a great prophet. And then came Christ. And Christ was a great prophet. But finally, there came the prophet Muhammad in the seventh century. And he was the greatest prophet. And what happens is this. The Jewish faith, the Christian faith, and the Islamic faith are all wrapped up in one. All of us respect Moses and Abraham. But the Jews stop there. The Christians respect Moses, Abraham, Christ. But Islam is the greatest because it encompasses all 
of these great black prophets. And this is the final revealed word of God is in, is in Islam or in the Muslim faith. questions then Malcolm will come out of character. Yes, sister. How do you feel about people wearing the simple accent and shirts or the hats and they just and they don't know what it means? Thank you, thank you. That's right. Anytime you see anybody with the X symbol on their hat, I will want each of you to go up to them and ask them what does that X mean? And if they can't tell you what that X means, tell them they need to go to the library and find out. <laughs> what, why'd you say that? <laughs> well then, you see it's been 30 years, my sister, uh, it's been 30 years, not everybody. But you can say it in a different way then, all right? What you can do is discuss with them the meaning of it and refer them, if they have the time, to go to the library. Now, as you know, the, the X is because the X stands for what? Unknown. Unknown. Unknown, which is our real name. Our language, our name, our heritage, was, was, it has been obliterated from our memory. That's why we have this white God. That's why we have all these problems. And the X represents that, the unknown factor. You see? So, since we don't know our real name, since we don't know our real language, that represents the unknown. So if my name was Malcolm X, I was the Malcolm, the only Malcolm in the mosque where I registered. But if your name is Charles 35X, that meant there were 34 other Charles in that mosque and you were the 35th one. Yes, ma'am. Let me, let me tell you this, let me say this. Uh, to be quite frank with you, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what color God was, right? It doesn't matter what color Christ was. It doesn't matter what color the Egyptians were or the Nubians. These things simply do not matter. However, ha! You see, they have made it matter. If they, would, if they would simply not get into what color Christ was, because it says in the Bible, there shall be no graven images. Right? There shall be no graven images. And in the Islamic faith, we do not show any representation of the prophet Muhammad. But the so-called, these Christians say, and it's in their Bible that thou shalt bow not down before no false images. There shall be no graven images. But they insist on parading a graven image before us that resembles them. They insist on making movies in which they show Moses as a white man. You see, so yes, ma'am, you're right. It doesn't matter if they would leave it at that. But if they're going to tell us, if you see, because ultimately the white is our relation. They sprang from us. They are from us. We are of the race of, we are of the race of man. You see what I'm saying? But if they insist on teaching our young people to be inferior, then it has to matter. Okay, just one, 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 one or two more. Yes, ma'am. Don't they contradict themselves because in the Bible it says that God was the color of copper and had woolen hair. Yeah, it says that, Je it says that the prophet Jesus was, was, his feet were like burnished brass, his hair was like lamb's wool, and his eyes were, his eyes were like fire, right? Okay? Now, as dark as I am, my eyes are not like fire. So, you, but you can see some brothers and sisters whose eyes are like fire. <laughs> you see? Their eyes, are, when, they, when you see, have you seen that? And the, and the palms in their hand are, are actually red. That's who we're talking about. 
You see? And it said, it said Moses put his hand, when he heard the sound in the burning bush, he put his hand against his, against his breast. And when he took his hand out, what color was it? He said it was white. Well, what kind of God would that be if, he was, if his hand was white when it went inside? <laughs> okay, one last question. How did it feel like when you took your trip to Mecca? Thank you. It felt like... You see, right now, right now, she knows something which we all knew when we were her age. You know what that is? That she can be anything she wants to be. You see? She knows she's the best. But it's up to us to maintain that image that she has and to support her. I want to answer your question, young lady, but let me just say this. You know what the young brothers and sisters that we have here, you know, when, you, when, when you're at home with your children or your nieces and nephews, what do they ask you when they come up to you? What do they ask you? Do they say, come, let's turn on the television set? No, they say, read me a story. <laughs> you see? They say, read me a story. Okay? And you say, do the homework, right? But, but at least, you see, the, ch the, the natural tendency of the child is to interact with the written word either on the page or face to face. That's their natural tendency. No child wants the babysitter. They want their family. So they only turn to television when we turn away. And the most important things that we can do, every time you sit down with your young brothers and sisters, your nieces, your nephews, your children, and you read to them, you're making an investment in the nation. Now, to answer your question, how did I feel? When I, when, I, when I went to Saudi Arabia, I felt like I was home. I felt like I was home because I was in the place where the Prophet Muhammad established this religion, which is the greatest religion of all, which is the final word of God. And when I was there, I saw people of many hues. I saw black, white. I saw people that, that looked very light, people that looked very dark. But there was a unity in there at that time. Now, since I've died, many people have changed history and said that I changed and I was no longer standing up for what I believed in. No, that's not true. I believe, I believe in the African nation. I believe in ourselves. But what happened when I went to, to, when I went to Mecca, I began to see beyond that and I began to understand that every white man in the world is not like the white people here. All right? But we still got to deal with what we got to deal with here. Okay? <laughs> you, let, me, let me tell you, do you, think, do you think we can get Dr. King? I think that it may, might be possible, and I will have Dr. Lewin speak to you on that when, when, when he comes down. Well, thank you, El Had from Lake Shabazz, Brother Malcolm X. Now, Dr. Lewin, chairperson of the Black Studies Department at Baruch College, will address you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I really had a great time. This is the, the first time I ever, we ever tried anything like this. And uh, the, the, where, where I got the idea from is from the students. Because I've seen the students get together in the class, and one person would play Malcolm, one would play King, and they would actually have a debate. You see? And what I realized is that, is that our people, in addition to all our talents, we, be, we are natural actors. And there are young men in this room today, and young women in this room today, who could play this part much better than me. You see, what happened is this. When we take a look at, uh, uh, Barry Gordy, and we look at Motown, and we look at uh, the Supremes, the Temptations, all these people, right? We say, these are the great black singers. Wow, these are the, must have been the best black singers in the country. You know who they were? They were the people from the nearest high school that he can get to. They were from the Glee Club of Northeastern High School, the nearest high school to his house. 
We all possess those, those types of talents. Uh, what I, okay. Oh, what was that about Kent? Yeah, so to answer the question, that could easily be arranged. In fact, I'm sure there's somebody in this room that we could get to come next time and, and play that part. I'd be happy to do it, but you possess the, you, you, you possess the talent to do it amongst yourselves, right? What I'm saying is, like for example, Spike Lee, Wesley Snipes, uh, Larry Fishburne. You know, Spike Lee didn't go through the whole country to, to find those people. These were the people that were nearest to hand. We, we, we naturally poss possess these talents. And I've been to some schools in which, you know what they're doing? The textbook is not that important. The students write the textbook themselves. This young lady that asked the question, those beautiful young sisters there, they can write their own textbook and their classmate can illustrate it. You see? That's what I'm saying. One of the things that Malcolm said, that, which I really believe in, we should never get lulled into a false sense of security, a complacency. It's unbelievable the heights that we can rise to once we just simply decide that we're going to do it. So what I, what I would like to do is I would like to, to spend some time, if, if, if you want, we could continue with the film, but is there, are there any other comments or statements before we, before we formally break up? question earlier about uh, this, the black on black violence. One of the things is that I think uh, many people are growing up very fast. You're in a, a very technological age, all right? You've got to go back. Uh, Malcolm talked about, he said, of all the disciplines, I mean, computer science, chemistry, biology, history is the most qualified to reward our research. You see, if you came from a great nation, and at this present time you're on your knees, there's got to be a reason why. There's got to be a reason why in all categories, in education, in all categories, we fall behind. You've got to go back and examine why you, how great you were then, and why you fell behind. A lot of us have got to start doing some serious reading, and that's very important. Computers are nice, and they're necessary, Television is nice and it's necessary, but you've got to be able to read. One of the things we, we examine is that the, the average American watches about 50 hours of television per week. Right? That's more than people normally work about 35 hours. 50 hours of television. The average African American watches 77 hours of TV per week. All right, so they, they, there's, this, there's this problem. And then you start to believe everything you see on TV. You see, it doesn't have a mental impact anymore. If, if you're walking along the side of the road every day and say it's, it's like a uh, water fell on some mud, eventually it's going to get hard. It's the same thing. When you visualize 34,000 murders by the time you're 16, it doesn't have any impact anymore. And that's one of the problems. A lot of you parents, Many of you are going to be parents. You're going to have to make sure your children turn that television off. All right, you can watch Channel 13, other programs, but you're going to have to have them read and understand that they were great before and they can be great again. And that's one of the problems. Okay. And thank you. And I want to close by saying this. This, he mentioned uh, my two books and they're available in the black bookstores, but this book, is the book he wrote, it's called No Justice, No Peace, from Emmett Till to Rodney King. You see, and what happens, what he does in this book is he goes back to, you, have you ever heard of a case called the Dred Scott case? Right? He goes back to the Dred Scott case, which was in 1850. He goes to the Emmett Till case. Then he takes you to Michael Stewart, Eleanor Bumpers, the Howard Beach case, Bensonhurst. You see, these things happen, and we tend to forget the details. But when you look up and you try to say, well, what happened in this case, what happened in that case? You know what's going to happen? It won't be in the library if we're not careful. But books like this will maintain the facts so that you can know what has happened. Another excellent book that you can find in the black bookstores is called What to Do If You Are Arrested or Framed by the Cops. That's an excellent book for everybody to read. For the, for the young black men, I recommend, and I recommend everybody, Read the autobiography of Malcolm X. 
I recommend everybody read that. If, they, if that was required reading for every high school student in this country, there would be no crime problem. I read the, ICE, the ISIS papers are excellent, is excellent, by Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. When you first read that book, you would say, this stuff can't all be true. And when I read it with my students, we said, oh, maybe 90% is true. But let me tell you, almost every bit of it is true. I want to reinforce what, what Dr. Morris has said. Uh, and this is an idea that people don't believe, but it's true. There are things, the money on television is not spent on the programming, it's spent on the commercials. And there are things in those commercials that are locked into your mind forever. Now I remember, now I can tell you a commercial I heard when I was the age of those young children there. You, you know, you, you, you brush your teeth with Pepsi in it, blah, blah, blah. You remember these things. 30, 40 years from now, things you see on television will still be embedded in your mind. And unless you know what the images are they're conveying to you, you'll be brainwashed. What does it mean when they constantly show you Shaquille O'Neal? Right? What, 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 what image is being conveyed? What, what, what is conveyed when he says, you want me to shoot it? Do you want me to throw it? What is he saying? And why is it you always see Shaquille O'Neal, but you never see Minister Farrakhan? Right? You see? What, what, what are the images being conveyed to you? There's a young man on television called, uh, in, in a show, his name is, uh, his, what's his name? Martin. Martin. That's the little boy, right? Did they make fun? The little boy that X, the X, Urkel, Urkel, right. Now what happened is this, people look at it and laugh, right? But what they don't understand is that he represents, he represents, he, he, he rep huh? he's very intelligent and he's doing well in school. Then we wonder why our young people will say, what's wrong with you, man? What you doing all that reading for? You acting white? You, they wonder why our young people say that. But if we can allow this show to come into our television, into our home, and laugh at this man who's bookish, you see? Who is Urkel? Spike Lee is Urkel, and look at what he's done. Okay? So what I, I'd like to close by saying one thing. Go to the nearest black bookstore where you live and inhabit that place. The writing is good, the facts are true, and it represents the stored knowledge of the ages. And uh, who knows, I might see you there, because I love to go to the, book, the black bookstores here in this area. So it was a pleasure being here, and if you want, in a few minutes we can continue the tape, and I want to thank you for giving me such a warm greeting. Thank you very much. Additional, uh, another very good book you should probably pick up, especially the ones that are in college, it's called The Miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson. All right, and there's, Naeem Akbar has a very good book out called Visions for Black Men. It's an excellent book. If you're concerned about the plight of black men, about gangs and crime and stuff, he gives you a very clear vision, Visions for Black Men. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, let's all have another hand for our two guest speakers. Okay, and we'd just like to um, thank our audience for being so bright and, and so attentive and, and such an excellent audience. Let's give our audience, a, let's give ourselves a hand. And we have our, our guests from um, all over Brooklyn and we also have the Johnson Prep School. Johnson Preparatory School. They're here, so you, could you still, could you please stand? They're an excellent independent black institution in our community. I'd just like to thank you all for coming. And um, as you might have seen, I know at Johnson Prep they have your books. Um, but this is one of uh, Dr. Lewin's books, Our Story. Here we have um, the picture of Malcolm and Martin on the cover. And it's, it's written in, you know, um, some very good pictures in here and good, and, and the story about um, 1950 to the year 2000, the story about the major events and what we have to do as a people. 
Okay, and here, you know, we want to hear, if, get some more information about Africa. Um, for the young people, you know, it's time to learn now while you're young. And there's no such thing as, well, this is too hard to read. Because Malcolm X, as remember, had uh, learned a lot about reading from reading the dictionary. He studied all the words in the dictionary when he was in prison. Now, that's a lot of words, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is an, another excellent book. Uh, I think there's some games in here, too, right? For you parents and young people, uh, these are a must books for our young people to have. OK, so Dr. Lou, I'd just like to thank you again. Now. Uh, I know that some people have classes, uh, and their class is over at 1.20 or 1.30. How many people um, would like to stay and, and see the rest of the video? Okay, because it's an excellent video. I think it's the best thing I've seen on uh, Malcolm X. And uh, for those of you who have to leave, if you could leave out quietly, and we're going to um, show the rest of the video. I'd just like to thank you all for coming. <laughs>